In 1931, the West Indies travelled to Australia to face a team brimming with confidence after Bradman's triumphs on the 1930 tour of England. Two players made more than 1,000 first-class runs that season, Don Bradman and George Headley. It was during this series Headley was dubbed the Black Bradman. George Headley uh, had a fine tour, did very well, and uh, subsequently improved on that form as his career unfolded. And history would undoubtedly uh, rank George Headley as one of the all-time great batsmen. And he, he was certainly a great player. Well, the history books tell you a lot about George Headley. And people used to refer to him as Atlas because he was pretty much the man that held up the West Indies team. If the West Indies got 220 runs, George Headley got 120, 130 out of that. And he did that on a regular basis. Headley had arrived in Australia as a predominantly offside batsman, and Australian leg spinner Clary Grimmett had a plan. He scored 100 in Melbourne against Victoria in, in an early tour match. And after that game, Hugh Trumbull, who was a former Australian cricketer and was the secretary of the Melbourne Cricket Club, said it was one of the best hundreds that he'd ever seen. But then word got out to the Australian team, Woodfall was the Victorian captain, and word got out that they worked out how to bowl at Headley. And Grimmett was, Clary Grimmett was their key, and he concentrated on Headley's leg stump. And Headley hardly scored a run in the first two tests. But then in the third test, he realised that he had to teach himself how to play on the leg side, and most specifically to get an on-drive. So he went into the nets and he just practised and practised and practised. And there are quotes from his teammates saying that uh, he would practise for hours and hours just learning how to play the on-drive. And so he came out for the third test and scored 100. And it was recognised as one of the best hundreds that the, the critics had seen. And by the end of the series, Grimmett himself and uh, Herbert Johnny Moyes, who was the leading Australian journalist at the time, and uh, Herbert Collins, the former Australian captain, all said that Headley was the best onside player that they'd ever seen. At the end of the, the tour, he was considered uh, one of the best onside players they'd seen. He was adaptable. Um, you, you see pictures of him, still pictures. I've only seen a little bit of cli uh, clips of him. But uh, he went right back. He used the crease. When he pulled, he pulled with his uh, back foot almost be behind the stumps. And when he went forward, he went right forward. And that's the hallmark of a, a really a great player. But uh, he dominated West Indies cricket. And of course, uh, he led the way for the great batsmen who were to follow. In 1935, England toured the West Indies for the second time. The first test was played on a substandard pitch, with Headley and Hammond playing extraordinary knocks in a low scoring match. He was almost at his best on wet wickets. Headley uh, was a man of extraordinary ability when things were, were difficult. I think he's probably up there with Hammond and, and might even have been a better bat than Hammond. There's been a comparison done between Headley and Bradman on wet wickets, um, uh, which showed that uh, of uh, on 13 innings on wet wickets, Headley got 57 times. Bradman had played 14 innings on wet wickets and got 50 once. Bradman on wet wickets uh, wasn't overly successful. Headley, Headley on wet wickets had to, be the, um, had to be the man. And so his record on wet wickets is quite extraordinary. And there are a number of people who saw Headley on wet wickets say he was the greatest wet wicket player ever. And these people would have seen Hobbs on wet wickets and Hammond on wet wickets. And yet they suggest that Headley was number one. With the series level, Headley made 270 not out in the last test in Jamaica. The West Indies won the match and the series, the first series win by a West Indian team against England, and their spearhead, George Headley, had become a folk hero. Being from Jamaica and being a black man in Jamaica at that time and having to go to England and travel all over the place and to still achieve what he achieved, I think that even puts more onus on the fact that he was a great man and on his abilities not just as a cricketer, but to overcome all the other peripheral things that would have affected his life. For the 1939 tour of England, many believed that George Headley should be the West Indian captain. It's a shame he couldn't have been captain earlier. I think he knew an enormous amount about the game. He knew everything about the game. Uh, West Indies cricket politics that stopped him from being captain 
uh, when you know he probably could have made his biggest contribution to the game. His contemporaries, to a man, suggest he would have been a superb captain. Um, and just, he became a statesman after he retired, so he cl clearly had the ability to um, communicate with his, um, his teammates. And the fact that he was such a great observer of opposition players, which he then applied to his own cricket, suggests that he would have been a, a, an excellent tactician as well. England won the series, but Headley was now universally recognised as one of the world's greatest batsmen. He was known as Atlas because of the way he carried the West Indian side. Yeah, George Headley was also known as Atlas, which quite simply because he was, um, it was recognised that he carried the uh, West Indies cricket world on his shoulders. He was as clear-cut an example in, in cricket history of a man carrying his side. The closest recent analogy I could think of would be Richard Hadley carrying the New Zealand bowling attack or perhaps Alan Border with the Australian batting in the 80s. But I think George Headley was more so than either of those. He really was the ultimate one-man band. Within days of the series ending, the world was at war, and George Headley's greatest days were over. <laughs>